Not be going too too far anywhere too fast. We got a we got something we want to give you. Uh, on behalf of Park Avenue Baptist Church, we are going to give you this this King James Study Bible. It's thick. Hope you wear it out. Uh, your notes for your sermon is in there. So be turning to First Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel chapter 17. And yes, his his blanks are all filled out just in case he missed anything. Uh, we're, uh, we're examining and we'll be looking at the story that you are all familiar with. You're, you're familiar with the story of David and Goliath. And though we may not face giants of his size or stature, uh, we can all say that we have all been in a battle, we've all been in a fight. And uh, Paul draws on that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 3, he says that, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And though, like I said, we may not have to wield a sword or a spear uh, as, as David will claim, the Lord doesn't deliver by those things. And in fact, he says in Zechariah, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And it is in the scripture that we take out and that I'm charging him specifically, but that does not excuse everyone here because we all face a battle, we all face a fight. And so I would have you and call you to the battle that having done all to stand, as the scripture says, that you would stand and fight the good fight and finish your course. That you be not entangled with the affairs of this life. That you strive lawfully so that you would not be disqualified. And but stand ready and equipped to every good work. So with that, I'm going to ask at this time if you would stand to the fight. Stand as we're going to look at the scripture together. We're going to look at the uh, first Samuel chapter 17 beginning in verse 1. He says, Now the Philistines, they gathered together their armies to battle, and they were gathered together at Shukoth, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shukoth and Azekah and Ephes de Men. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah. And they set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountaintop on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the top of the other side, and there was a valley between them. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood, I'm sorry, at verse 4, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, about nine to ten feet tall. Verse 8, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come, come down to me. If you be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. Verse 10, And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day, Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Let's pray together. And Father, we know that the battle is not ours. It belongs to you. Lord, there are, more, there are so many people here that they are either about to, they're in the midst of a battle or they're about to go into a battle. And Lord, I pray that you would comfort their hearts and assure them to know that it, the victory belongs to you, and if the victory belongs to you, the means of that victory also belongs to you. Lord, we pray for Bryce and the ministry that you've called him to and the place that you have prepared for him, that, Lord, that he would rise up and stand against those that, against the enemy that seeks to depose him, that seeks to destroy him, that, Lord, that he would take every occasion and know that the victory belongs to you. And it's in... Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
Now, uh, there are four main lessons I want to convey to you concerning the Valley of Elah. I call it the lessons fa found in the Valley of Elah. Now, David has been anointed king. I'm going to give you a little, pre uh, give you a little text in this, pretext in this, is that, Lord has, uh, that, that David has been anointed king. The problem is Saul's still anointed king. And upon, uh, uh, and, being, uh, and upon being anointed as king, you would think, you would think if you were anointed king, if somebody, if a prophet came to you saying, you are going to be king over this people. And he does so in the front of all your brothers and sisters. You would think that there were certain responsibilities that would be beneath you at that point, wouldn't you think? There are certain things that you wouldn't have to do anymore. Your brother and sister couldn't command you, hey, I'm king, Right? And so upon, uh, there's a lesson that I want you to see in this that David mastered. And if you are going to be victorious, you need to learn this first lesson, the lesson of the handling of obscurity. You need to learn and be able to handle obscurity. That is to say there's nothing beneath you. There is nothing beneath you. Where do we see this? Look at, look at verse 14. And David was the youngest. And, and the three eldest, they followed Saul. But David, after he'd been anointed king, what does he do? Uh, what does he, do? he goes back to returning from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. Like I said, there are certain responsibilities that you would think is a little bit beneath you, don't you think, if you were being anointed king? But don't you get so high-minded, don't you get so prideful that you can't say, I don't, I don't have to do that anymore. I am above that. No one's above the commandment. You shall honor your father and mother. Where, whose house did he go back to? He went back to dad's house. And there he fed and he shepherded dad's sheep. So the first lesson, again, that I want you to consider is that before David fought under the big lights of Goliath, he first mastered obscurity. As, as he learned how to behave himself when no one was looking. Does that make sense? He knew how to behave when no one was looking. And isn't it true? That's what, what a lot of people say. The real you, the real you is exposed. If, you were, if I were to tell you, you, or you could be invisible, you can do whatever you wanted, and you could get away with it, what would you do? That is the real you. That's the real you. And if you don't know how to handle that, then you won't be able to handle it when you're being observed. If you can't handle it when nobody's looking, you will not be able to handle it when everyone is looking. And so what, did, what was the first lesson that God prepared David before he fought the Philistine? I want you to put this down big, bold, and plain, is that he had to handle when no one else was looking. What does that mean for Bryce? No one's going to tell you to get up in the morning. No one's going to tell you to study. No one's going to tell you what the right thing is going to be that day. No one's going to tell you you need to go to bed. You will have that responsibility that you must handle and that you must wield when no one else is looking. You must do the right thing when no one is, is, is going to tell you otherwise. All right, the classroom of, uh, of obscurity. He handled himself wisely in matter. How do I know? Because he says so in verse 34. And David said unto Saul, Your servant kept his father's sheep. What did you do when nobody was looking, David? What were you up to? Well, there came a bear and a lion. And he took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him when no one was looking, and I smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught that lion by his beard, and I smote him and slew him. That's how you handle the, the lesson of obscurity. No one was looking. And he did the right thing. He did the brave thing when no one would... Well, there was not going to be the applause of men saying, Wow, David, you saved that lamb. There was not going to be any of those things. And so you know that you need to do the right thing, even though he was not going to be accredited for those things. Because isn't it true, guys? All right, men, here's, here's one. When we catch that fish when no one's looking, it was this big, wasn't it? You think David was exaggerating when he said, I killed a lion and I killed a bear? I don't think so. And it, it was proven when he defeated Goliath. Now, you can say a lot of things, a lot of lies. It was this big, but whenever that fish, another fish gets on the line and you miss it and it was that big, <laughs> nobody's going to believe you. All right, in the classroom of obscurity, no one's going to be there to make sure that you do the right thing 
So note the valuable lesson, the important lesson that David learned here. And let me put this to you too. You'll learn, you'll see it happen because whenever you go your freshman year, your first semester, you'll note the people that couldn't handle it because they won't be there for the second semester because they went out and did all the wrong things when nobody was looking and they will not remain. So next, that's the first thing. The next thing I want you to see is the handling and this is why your notes are wrong is that I, I, gave, uh, Ms. Shan, uh, I gave Ms. Shannon the rough draft. The second one is the handling of criticism. You need to be able to be critiqued. You need to be able to handle uh, criticism and know when it's been wisely given to you and know when it's been harmfully given to you. And that comes with discernment and age and, and, and maturity. Now, David, in verse 22, it says that he left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of uh, the carriage, and he ran into the army, and he came and he saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up that champion, that Philistine of Gath, and Goliath by name, and out of the armies of the Philistines, and he spake according to the same words. But this time, David heard him. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man? Have you seen this guy that has come up? Surely to defy Israel has he come up. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make, him, uh, make his father ha father's house free in Israel. Verse 28 said, that oldest brother said, Elab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, David, and his anger, it says, was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart. You are come down here that you might see a battle. All you're trying to do is egg on a fight that you might see it. So the first lesson of criticism I want you to see is that those who are not doing anything, what were they doing? Those who, who uh, are the most critical are the people that aren't doing anything will be the ones that criticize. They're the armchair quarterbacks that, uh, that you will have to deal with. And what you need to understand is that many times your desire to do something is an indictment on their unwillingness to do anything. And you need to be able to say and search within yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is there any, is there any weight to their criticism? So the first thing that they typically criticize, you write it down. Your character will be called into question. Your character will be called into question. Where do we see that? Look again in verse 28. And Eliab his eldest brother, and when he spake unto the man, Eliab's anger kindled against David, and he says, Why have you come down hither? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? You need to live a life above reproach. Because in so doing, you will limit the ammunition of those that would criticize and harmfully subvert your efforts in doing the right thing. You need to live above reproach. And we see that with Paul telling Titus. He said uh, in chapter 2, verse 6, Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded and in all things showing yourself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed when they have no evil thing to say of you. If you live above reproach, all they can attack is your character. And when they do so attack your character, they will be ashamed seeing that they have attacked someone who was innocent of those things. So what we see here is we see it, it, it hits close to home. It literally is home. It's your oldest brother in this case. And here he sees his family. Family's the one that's accusing David in the arena of his character. Now, this is the most difficult in handling. Why? Because it's personal when people start attacking character, right? When people start attacking who you are. Oh, it gets personal real quick. But what did, what did the record show? That he wasn't a hireling when he was watching his dad's sheep. He was willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And where do we see that character in? 
and the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 10. He was the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. And where do we see that with? We see that here with David. And it was at this record, by the way, that, that Saul committed him to that charge that he could go and fight. What was that charge? Remember? He said, The Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion, and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. First, level, first time of criticism is that they will attack your character. The second thing is, is your motives will be called into question. Your motives will be called in question. Look again in David with Eliab. He says, I know your pride. What's your motive here? You're trying to stir up a fight. The naughtiness of your heart for you are come down that you may see the battle. The accusation is levied against people who are not invested in the situation. Let me say that again. This kind of accusation is typically given to people who are not invested in the situation. But David wasn't there to egg on a fight. He was there to start a fight, and it was going to be his hand in the fight. How do we know that? How do we silence that kind of criticism? When your motives are called into the fight, show that you're invested in it. Show that you're invested in it. David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And David said to Saul, Let no man heart fail him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. Why? Because I'm invested. You can question my motives all day long, but I'm invested in this matter. And he was willing to do what no one else was willing to do. That's how you handle the criticism of motive, is when you're willing. Nothing's beneath you. Because you've already handled the you've already handled the lesson of obscurity, and so you also will be aware of that when no one's doing anything or no one's wanting to put their hand to that plow, and no one wants to put their hand to that plow, you put your hand to it and show I'm invested. You want to check my motives? I've already got my hand to the plow, and I'm not looking back because he that looks back is not fit for the king. Saul. All right, your uh, next thing, and this is very much in keeping with you, Bryce. Your inexperience and your youth will be despised. But I want you to understand, in God's economy, one's youth and, econ and, one's youth and inexperience are not, are not even weighed in whether or not God is going to use such a person. We see so here with David. And Saul said to David, or this is where the criticism of his youth, Saul said to David, you are, just a, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight against him. You're just a youth. And this man has been fighting since his youth. And many will look upon your youth and cite it as a liability. But that's not, well, that's not what Paul told Timothy. He said, let no man despise your youth. But you are to be an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity, spirit, faith, and in purity. Jeremiah was a youth whenever God called him. Then said I, this is Jeremiah, he says, I, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm just a child. But what did the Lord say? Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command you to speak, that you shall speak. Be not afraid of their faces. And this is the promise that you need to take with you. Iterated over and over and over again, especially in Joshua, we say, For I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And that's inexperience is not a liability. Your youth is not a liability. So don't focus on your inexperience in ministry or in work, but focus on God and his ability, and all of that criticism will go away. Okay? Now, I can't shield you from criticism. Some is helpful. Some is good at criticism. Some of it's bad. And it's going to take a, mature, a maturity that you need to possess to know and weigh them and know how to handle them. But let's look at David's preparation next. His preparation. First thing he understood was that there was a cause worth fighting for. This is the very means that will not quiet naysayers, but it will quiet your spirit. 
It's not going to quiet the people. They're going to uh, they're going to criticize what you're doing, but it'll calm you in knowing that you're doing the right thing. Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for someone to stand up and do the right thing? There will be a time when the voices of the critics may come from people you respect and love. But you just remind yourself that the cause for which you strive for, David said, what have I done? Is there not a cause? He noted also, he he understood that there was a cause, but then he noted God's past deliverances. God had delivered him time and time again. And in the face of adversity, you need to look back, not look forward, you need to look back and see where God had taken you through a tough time. And you remember that God brought you through it. He brought you to it, and he's going to bring you through it again. There's no such thing for the child of God. There's no such thing as failure. There is no such thing as failure. Everything that you go through, you put this down, everything that you go through, God is using it to make you into the young man, young woman, middle-aged man, middle-aged woman, older man, older woman, into what he wants you to become. Why? He's going to use those things in the present. There's no such thing as leftover pieces of your life that God will not, choose not to use. And the promise of Romans 8, 28 holds true to this. All things work together for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. And David said to Saul, Thy servant, he kept the sheep, his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear. If me and you saw a lion and a bear, we'd say, boy, that's a bad day, right? There are going to be bad days when you're going to be faced with such adversity. But I like what one author pointed. He didn't see that as a bad day or adversity. He saw that as an opportunity. He saw it as an opportunity. Here's what you need to understand. David had been anointed king. And he knew and he trusted God was going to see him to that throne. Even if there was a lion or a bear standing in the way. We'll say, well, Brother Heath, that's nice. He has that promise. You have been given eternal life. You cannot die if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that? Do you believe that? Jesus put, put it to him that way. He that believes on me shall never die. And you have that same confidence. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul said, it's better for me that I depart, but it's more needful that I stay here and remain for you. I think we have the wrong perception. We think of death as the end. It's not. And it's not the beginning either. When you believed on Christ, you have eternal life at that point in time. You don't, you don't receive it when you die. You have it immediately. And we see here that David, again, and, uh, and he notes the past deliverances in verse 34. He kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and he took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out after him. Now, do you go after a Hey, I think, hey, let him have his lamb chops. I'm going to be okay, okay? But he goes after him, and he delivers him out of the mouth, that lamb out of the mouth, and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. And the servant... Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he has, de- he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me, he's looking at the past, he's seeing the deliverance of the past, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you.